Hello everybody, today we are looking at Unit 3 Biology Area Study 1, um, looking into DNA manipulation techniques and applications. So we will be summarising, um, so it's really great for revision, not to just learn the content, um, the use of enzymes to manipulate DNA. So we'll look at um, ligase, endonuclease and polymerases. We'll be looking at CRISPR-Cas9 in bacteria, amplifying DNA using PCR. Um, recombinant plasmids and looking at the difference between GMOs and TGOs. So DNA manipulation speaks for itself. How can we manipulate DNA? How can we modify it, change it, alter it to include things and to remove things? The enzymes that are involved are these three here that we're going to look at. So the first one is what we call endonucleases. They are what we call restriction enzymes and they are basically our scissors. Okay, so they're used to cut DNA into smaller fragments at really precise locations. And those locations that they're cutting at are called our recognition sites. We can cut DNA in two ways. First way is by cutting a blunt end, and the second way is by cutting a sticky end. So a blunt end is where the restriction enzyme cuts and it doesn't leave any overhanging region. Um, Whereas a sticky end is where it does leave a bit of an overhang, as you can see here. So DNA that's produced in this way with a sticky end um, can be joined with another complementary sticky end as well. Okay, so endonucleases or restriction enzymes, all about cutting. Ligases is all about joining, okay, the glue. So they basically act to catalyze the joining of two double-stranded um, DNA pieces at their sugar phosphate backbone. This process of joining together is called ligation, okay? And this is primarily used in what we call recombinant plasmids, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And the third enzyme is what we call a polymerase, which you may have heard of when we're talking about RNA polymerase, but they're basically enzymes that are going to synthesize a DNA or RNA molecule from deoxyribonucleotides or ribonucleotides. So they're essential for sort of creating that extra um, additional strand. So DNA synthesis makes DNA copies, RNA synthesis makes RNA from DNA. Okay. Looking into CRISPR, okay, so CRISPR has nine. So CRISPR is basically a naturally occurring sequence of DNA that's found in bacteria and it plays an important role in the defense against viral attacks. So the CRISPR itself actually stands for clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Okay, and they're associated with the protein 9. So this technique basically provides an alternative to just traditional restriction enzymes. Okay, So similar to restriction enzymes, what they um, are doing is they use a guide RNA to recognize and cleave invading DNA. Okay, And by using this, we can teach this Cas9 protein um, to recognize specific DNA and then be able to cut it. Okay, So the Cas9 Nine protein is a DNA tool that can recognize and cut any section of DNA more quickly and effectively than some of the best restriction enzymes that we can get our hands on. Um, and theoretically, it can be used to insert, alter, or remove any genes in any location in an organism's genome. Okay, But due to some ethical um, considerations, the genetic modification using this Cas9 protein is used very sparingly, um, and its use is almost non-existent in humans. However, in the future, who knows what's going to happen? The Cas9 protein may prove to be safe and may be used um, as a precise tool for like various gene therapies and genetic modifications. But basically, CRISPR-Cas9 is adapted from defense mechanisms against viral um, virus of bacteria. So it targets by guiding RNA leading to cut the target DNA sequence. And hopefully you'll see this in application a lot more in class. The next bit where DNA is important is in what we call DNA profiling. So DNA profiling is all about the process of being able to identify um, using genetic information. So we're comparing DNA profiles of different people um, and looking at sort of commonalities between them to see if a person was at a crime scene, paternity testing to see who the dad is, um, adoptions, people want to find out who their parents were deceased, find out who they're related to, that kind of thing. So comparing DNA. So it's also known as DNA fingerprinting and it can basically be used for a variety of things. It can be used to identify and um, convict 
perpetrators of crimes. It can be used to determine parental lineage, deceased um, individuals after tragedies, matching organ donors and patients. Um, ethically, could ask what organisations have access to this data, who has ownership of the data. People might object to their own DNA being sequenced. Their data might be leaked, may not 100% be reliable. So there are some pros and cons of DNA profiling. In terms of DNA and testing on DNA, usually say we're at a crime scene and we only have one strand of DNA that's been left over and we're sequencing that. Obviously, we're not going to want to do all of those tests on that one piece of DNA. We want to do multiple tests. So what we're going to do is we're going to make copies of DNA. And the process of making copies is also called DNA amplification. Okay, and this process that we follow is called PCR. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And it's sort of split into three major steps. The first step is basically once we've got our DNA, it's double stranded, we want to distinguish the two strands from one another. Okay, so we denature that DNA. We heat up the DNA to about 90 to 95 degrees where our two DNA strands are going to separate. Okay, so denaturation, DNA separates. The next bit is where primers are added. Okay, primers are basically short strands of mRNA and they're going to be annealed to the DNA. It's called the annealing stage. And this happens at 50 to 55 degrees. So primers, these little things here, are going to get added over here. All right, so you can see in this picture, these are moving over here. Okay. The sample is then going to be cooled to 72 degrees. And this is where polymerase, um, in this example, it's TAC polymerase, is going to bind to these primers. Okay, so you can see this little circular thing here binding to the primer um, of the exposed DNA strand, and it's going to help synthesize a complementary strand. So you can see here that a complementary strand is now being created. And after one cycle, there's now going to be two copies of the original cycle sample. And then if you do it again, there's going to be four copies. Do it again, there's going to be eight copies. It's very exponential growth. But basically, those three temperatures are what you need to remember. Denaturation at 99.95, um, annealing at 50 to 50 and then our polymerase at 72 degrees. This, of course, is important when we are then going to be analysing our DNA. So we analyse it by this process called gel electrophoresis. And gel electrophoresis is basically a technique that's used to separate DNA molecules and it separates them based on their size and their electric charge. So what happens, and hopefully you'll be lucky enough to do some of these pracs in class, is um, preparing the DNA for gel electrophoresis. So we need to prepare it by cutting it into that smaller fragments, um, and it's going to have a range of DNAs of different lengths. And these enzymes that are cutting those are going to be those restriction enzymes that we spoke about earlier, those endonucleases. But basically we're going to, in a gel, have these wells lined up. So basically they're holes in the gel. And in each hole or in each well, we're going to put a little bit of DNA. Okay, so our DNA is inserted and it's inserted at the negative end. So at where our wells are, we, that's a negative charge. And where our DNA is going to be moving towards is our positive charge. Okay, so we insert it into the wells. We turn this machine on and our DNA is going to slowly move. Because DNA is negatively charged, it's going to be moving towards the positive end. Okay, so your DNA is going to start to separate. Um, your smaller fragments are going to move quicker through the gel and your larger fragments are going to move slower through the gel. Okay, so we can then have those DNA movement. And if we've got markers along the side where we sort of know those lengths, um, sort of acting as like a control that we can compare against, we can then figure out the exact sizes of those DNA fragments and see if they can match up. Okay, so here you can see um, that this band in the first well and this band in the second um, column, they match up at 400 base pairs, so they are the same segment of DNA. Okay. Um, there is often also a negative control which checks for contamination, and it's basically running a sample without any DNA. Okay, to make sure that it is all working properly the way that it should. The next topic, or the next sort of bit that we look at, is what we call recombinant plasmids. And recombinant plasmids are basically transforming bacterial cells. Okay, 
Um, what is required here is a vector, which is basically a self-replicating DNA molecule. So the type of vector that we look at is a plasmid, and it's basically used to transmit a gene from one thing into another thing. Okay, so plasmids are basically um, chromosomes occurring naturally in bacteria, and we're looking at a circular piece of DNA here. So what is happening, okay, is if we look at this diagram on the right, I have a recognition site, okay, that I'm going to cut. So I'm going to use a restriction enzyme to cut into here. I'm going to insert my gene of interest that will also have complementary base pairs, okay, because we've used the same restriction enzyme. We're then going to use ligase to join that up together, okay? So now our gene of interest, which is this bit, has been inserted into this part here, okay, which in between the blues. What we can then do is insert that recombinant plasmid because it now has our gene of interest inserted into it into a bacteria. Along with that, we also include what we call an antibiotic resistance gene. Okay, and this is going to help us determine whether our gene of interest has also been taken up. Because if your gene of interest is taken up, then that's the antibiotic resistance gene has also been taken up. So what we do once we've put this into the bacteria is we grow it on a normal agar plate, a nutrient agar plate. And if the bacteria grow, there's going to be bacteria there that are transformed and untransformed. Okay. But if we put the bacteria on a agar plate that has antibiotics, only the bacteria that grow are the ones that have the antibiotic resistance gene. And if they have the antibiotic resistance gene, that means they must also have that gene of interest that we've inserted into them. So what we can then do is grow those particular colonies of bacteria, extract them, and we can extract that gene of interest. So say we want to like mass produce insulin, um, this is a way that we can do that. The final part that we look at is genetically modified organisms and transgenic organisms. So a genetically modified organism is basically any organism where its genome or its genes have been altered. So things have been added, things have been removed. Basically used a lot in agriculture, so things like cotton, maize, potato, canola, and rice. Um, it's anything that's been altered. The specific of a transgenic organism, however, is where it's an organism that has had another species DNA inserted into it. So something like these glowfish is where this glow has been taken from another organism, inserted into these fish and made them glow in the dark. Okay, so it's specifically from another species inserted into one organism, whereas genetically modified is just either from the same species added or just removed in general. Of course, with all of this comes some implications. So you need to know pros and cons for biological, social, and ethical implications of this. So in terms of biological implications, genetically modified usually have a better crop productivity. They're usually insect resistant, um, and they can be made to have improved nutritional content. Whereas on the downside, they might lose their effectiveness. Okay, They might evolve resistance. Um, could result in loss of genetic variation between populations. Social implications. So pros, it could lead to increased productivity, meaning more food is produced, meaning to more food security for the community. Um, you know, they can survive in adverse conditions. Um, it might be resulting in larger profits for farmers, whereas the con is maybe having to buy new genetically modified seeds every season, okay, which could be costly at the beginning of each season for people. And then, of course, ethical implications is some people might believe that, you know, we've got access to this, so why not use it um, with, like, nutrition and wealth and the overall health of humanity, whereas the con, people might consider them to be unnatural, okay? We're playing God. We're intervening in things that we shouldn't intervene in. So there's some pros and cons there. You need to be able to list a few and be able to discuss it based on the example that you might be given. That is it for this area of study. If you guys have any questions, I know that I sped through it quite quickly. It's, of course, a summary, just so you know that you've covered the main bases. Um, but yes, if you do have any questions, leave them in the comments and I will be sure to get to them and help you out. Anyway, have a good day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.